Hello and welcome to another episode of Adventures in Local Marketing. I'm your host, Christian Bannister, Head of Marketing at Bright Local. On this episode, I'm talking with Carrie Hill from Sterling Sky, and we're diving deep into the broad world of content. We're going to cover everything from research to writing to testing. Now, content is key to not only ranking high in local search, but also making sure that you're converting customers. And it's something that takes a lot of practice to get right. So I wanted to find out a lot more about how we as marketers can get better at creating content that gets results. So Carrie shared a lot of secrets with me on this episode to make not only the words, but also the leads flow. We'll be covering how to do effective content research, how to ensure content doesn't just rank, but also converts, the mistakes you need to avoid when creating content. And Carrie will also be sharing some tips and the methods she uses to make content writing that much easier. So let's jump right into my conversation with Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining me on Adventures in Local Marketing. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, you appeared on a bright local webinar earlier in the year, and it was one of our most popular of the year. Loads of questions, really good feedback. So we're actually going to continue a bit of that conversation around content. So I'm very excited to dive into that. But I wanted to kick off by learning a bit about you and your role at Sterling Sky. So what sorts of clients do you work with at Sterling Sky and how are you helping them on a day-to-day -day basis? At Sterling Sky, we do only local marketing. We don't have any national focus clients. Um, and we run you know, a really wide array, lots of lawyers, doctors, dermatologists, you know, those kind of people who generally seek out local marketing. We have landscapers, um, arborists, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the more obscure kind of fun ones. Uh, we have a security company, like they install security systems. Um, you know, just basically a handyman with quite a few locations in Florida. Um, HVAC companies, a big HVAC company in uh, Canada. So basically any company that needs to do better locally that we don't really have a, we don't take that category kind of <laughs> list. Um, the, the categories we, that everybody struggles with, um, you know, locksmiths, garage door, um, those type of categories. We have some of those clients, certainly. Um, one thing, you know, I can really appreciate about Joy is that she's very discerning, might be the right word, <laughs> and, um, and is picky about the caliber of client that comes on board. And so we never have to worry about like being a few months into a, an engagement and being like, I think these people are spammers. <laughs> oh, really? You know? So, um, which, you know, happened to me uh, before I worked for Sterling Sky a couple times. And, you know, I'd be like, this just, there's something, this isn't passing the sniff test for me. I don't think you're legit, you know? And then you have to like gently extract yourself from a situation, right? Like, um, well, it's been great, but... <laughs> So, um, so we kind of run the gamut of all kinds of local clients. You know, we focus a lot on um, spam fighting, GMB optimization, content is real big for us. Um, but what I really can appreciate as well is that everything is, all of our marketing is done from a conversion standpoint. It's not just a, hey, you got this number one ranking. It's, hey, your leads increased X, Y, Z. You know, that's what we really focus on right is not just doing the work to do the work but doing the work to increase our clients business and we have a lot of really happy clients because of that so um, I think it's the right formula okay so very conversion focused um, how does content play into that I can imagine it plays a big part but maybe you could tell me a bit about what content looks like at Sterling Sky Sure. So a lot of our clients come to us with either one or multiple locations, right? So 
even clients with multiple locations more than likely want to rank in municipalities outside of where their brick and mortar is, or they might even not have a brick and mortar. We have a few service area businesses as well. And without good content, well-optimized, well-thought-out, well-written, planned content, you're really not going to stretch beyond your local radius, right, where your brick and mortar is. So, you know, ranking in those neighborhoods and communities that may not be part of your zip code is really going to be tough for a local business if you're not really focused on content to make it happen. So that's kind of where we bring content into the equation is, you know, GMB and the right primary category and having the homepage optimized for your main location and keywords and your address, you know, everything's on point there is going to help you rank and get in that three pack for the city you're physically located in. But there's a lot of businesses and most businesses, that's not good enough. That's not enough of a customer base for them to make it. They want to reach out further than just their zip or postcode. So they need content to rank in those places. And that's where we bring that piece into the equation. Okay, so obviously content's quite a broad term. Sure. So mm -hmm. what, what would you say content covers both at you know, Sterling Sky, but also in the context of a local marketing strategy? So I think um, content it kind of serves a few purpose purposes. And so we have to think about what purpose we're trying to serve. We're we trying to engage with a customer. Are we trying to rank better? Um, are we trying to convert that customer? So what, when we think about content, we think about a who, what persona are we marketing to or, or are we just writing this purely to get some rankings? I hate that kind of content. That's not my, my favorite way to do things, but sometimes that's just what the doctor ordered. So that's what we're doing kind of thing. And um, so I think if we're really working on a piece of content to engage and convert, we're looking at words, we're looking at maybe video or um, graphics that grab the eye, um, you know, a so kind of a social voice that brings that pre-primed customer into the website that they've already got an expectation set and you're building on that expectation so that they're more likely to convert. Um, content is reviews, content, um, you know, uh, is calls to action. So it's like, it runs the gamut, but, you know, if we're talking about purely for SEO purposes, it's words. And those words could come from a video embed, right? Like a transcript or something that you're putting on the page. But really, the words have to be there to rank, in my opinion. Um, yeah, Google's getting better at parsing content out of a video or pulling it off of a layer in a graphic image or a photo. But really, you know, if, if you're going to sit around and wait for that to happen, I think you're kind of waiting and waiting and waiting for that to really be the thing that pushes you over the top. The words on the page really are what's going to have to make the difference there. And, and so, you know, when we're talking about converting and engaging with the customer, we're talking about all kinds of content, audio, video, visual, words on the page, you know, all of that. But when we're talking about um, engaging the search engine, you've got to have that text on the page on point. I mean, that's the, the thing that's going to do it. You know, users more than likely aren't going to read a wall of words. So how do you mix those two together? right? So how do you appeal to the conversion point of the customer, but also get the words on the page for the search engine and in a way that makes the search engine happy and makes the customer more likely to convert? And I think, I mean, that, that kind of tipping point, that friction point and making that a smooth point is the piece I like. It's like, so I wrote this and it ranked really well and Google really liked it, but it also increased conversions. And that's kind of the the sim symbiotic relationship I want to see, right? <laughs> I can imagine it's a bit of a, a chicken and the egg approach, which is, you know, you need to get people to the page, but, you know, you need to have the page actually perform what needs to be done, which is, you know, converting a customer. And there's always that slight compromise that maybe you have to make. Um, do you have any tips or tricks that you actually use? Or is there any processes you go through to say, well, you know, we can't just write for the search engine, right? We've got to write for humans, but at the same time, we need to make sure the search engines are ranking this page. 
Right. So I think um, when I first write a page of content, and it's a process, you don't just write a page of content, throw it up live, and you're done with it. If you're not willing to test and retest and iterate on your tests and understand what's working and not working for your audience and looking at your analytics, you're sort of coming into the game already, you know, with two strikes and another, <laughs> you're, you're about to strike out, right? Like that's, you know, <laughs> you're, you're, almost to the end of the game at that point in time. And you're not going to, you're not going to be successful. So I think that when you come in to looking at content as a process, so for the first thing I'll usually do is put a page up that I'm pretty sure the search engines are going to like, because I can't really measure its success if I can't get people to it. Um, we might also test that page of content with paid advertising as well. If we want, want to accelerate um, how, how it's testing and how people are engaging with the page, because we can, you know, throw some ads at it and get people there a lot faster than waiting for the search engines to decide it's, you know, top five worthy maybe or whatever we're aiming for. So once we build that page for the search engines and we start getting people to the page, then we can start looking at their engagement and behavior. What call to action points are they clicking on? What are they not clicking on? we're not getting our form submissions. Is the form in the right spot on the page? Maybe we need to make it sticky so it slides in the sidebar up and down as they scroll up and down the page. What, what element can help us make this page convert better? And so then we start testing adding buttons or adding the form right on the page possibly or you know bolding the phone number within the content or just bolding call to action links within the content. What's going to engage the user more? And it's testing. It's very rarely do we write a page and throw it up and be like, okay, that's done. Check it off the list. Move on to the next task. It's putting the page up you know, tickling that task for, you know, two weeks to a month, coming back to it, see how it's performing, make some tweaks, see what's going on. Is it not right? Is it not even being picked up by Google? Wait a minute, what's going on here? Why do they not like this page? Did I, you know, did we not internally link it well? Because I think that's a big part of content that gets missed is the internal linking piece. Um, in my opinion, the person that puts the content on the website is responsible for making sure it's linked within the website hierarchy correctly. Um, and so you, you, it's a process to get pages to rank and convert. It's not just about writing some stuff and throwing it up and, and walking away, right? That's just not how it works to make, to be successful with content creation. You gotta look at the engagement and see if people like it and then test, 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 test more. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, so many things you can do with testing and I don't think people do it enough. And it's frustrating for me because it's really not that hard to test. Hey, even if you don't want to set up Google optimize or some other platform to do AB testing, you can look at your activity for these two weeks, change the color of the button or the location of a call to action and look at the activity for the next two weeks, you know, a seasonal business that's a little bit harder, but you know, very simple tests like that can make a big difference. Tests like moving content around on a page. I talked about a case study at the most recent local university where um, we had a competitor and a Home Depot swapping in and out for a um, featured snippet. And our client really wanted it, <laughs> wanted that featured snippet. And Joy tested for almost a year trying to figure out how to get that featured snippet for the client. And really the, at the end of all of the things that she tried, the thing that worked was moving an ordered list of steps to take to the top from the bottom of the page. So sometimes just rearranging your content can have an incredibly big impact as far as ranking goes. And then once we get that ranking and we've got that traffic coming in, then we start testing the calls to action. And sometimes we put calls to action there and they're just total duds and they make the page tank and we're like, oh, er, no, move <laughs> that one back out again. You know, cause it, that's what testing is. It's a, it's a series of successes and failures. And you hope you have more successes and failure than failures, but you just don't know, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I always think the kind of speed of which you're testing is the first measure of success. There's obviously a lot of inertia around changing things. 
but actually mm-hmm. you kind of need to get over that and be into this kind of process of obviously based off a hypothesis and not just you know random but great quick, continuous testing that feels like okay this one might not be successful but at least we're doing something it's something that we've uh, been working on ourselves at, at bright local and i was just think how quickly are you testing that should be your first measure a lot of people don't agree with me on this point, but I think a lot of testing is gut. Even when you're just forming your hypothesis, it's like, you know, this contrast color, I'm not, I'm not wild about it. Let, I don't think other people like it either. Let's try this other one. And I could be totally wrong. And I think that's one of the, the things with testing that maybe people are more hesitant about. They don't want to be proven wrong. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know. I don't have any ego around it. I just want it. I just want more leads. And if that means I was wrong, I'll take that down and we'll try something else. I don't have a problem with that. But um, I think that you have to be willing to kind of just think about all the different things that could make a difference on this page to that conversion point and be willing to test them. And honestly, Google Optimize is not hard to use. You know, it's pretty simple to set up and use. And and the way Optimizer used to be, like when it first came out, when I first started started using it, it was so kludgy. It's such a pain in the ass. We yeah. thought it was really neat. It was really neat. We're like, oh, this is exciting. But just using it was like, oh, God, that's so frustrating. Now it's not really like that. You can like edit right on the page. It's got a like a, I don't know what they call those editors, like oh, a live yeah, editor. Wig. Yeah, you can just like, okay, change the words in this button. 50% of the people see this one, 50% see this one, you know, and it took it, once you get the initial setup done, those tests take you like, you know, five minutes, and then it tells you the statistical winner. So you don't even have to like do math, which is not my strong point. So, <laughs> so I really appreciate the tool being like, this one sucked, don't do this. And and this one won, good job, Carrie. <laughs> yeah. You know, that I appreciate that because I, the math is not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's really accessible, Google Optimize. You also get free tests. So I think you can test five at the same time. So anyone mm-hmm. who's not using it, you know, just go in and I'm sure you'll be able to figure out how you can quickly do some tests. And the fact is, it's like you're not going to be learning on what you need to improve unless you put it out there and get some data back mm-hmm. from it. Yeah, and, you know, like I said, I, we ha- I have duds all the time. I test things like I thought putting, um, changing the wording on a button on the local university website was going to help me get more forum signs, signups. And that was false. (laughs) 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 Like like, that was a big F fail. Like, like, I don't know. I think it was like a 10% to 90% loser. Like it was bad. (laughs) So I was like, okay, never mind. (laughs) You know, you just have to be, have no ego around it and be willing to try things. And they're not all going to, be successful but if you don't try you don't know yep definitely been there definitely had a few duds when it comes to a b testing but you know that's <laughs> that's it it's like you know you're not gonna you're not gonna hit a jackpot every time it's about just continuing to test really well and i think a lot of times marketers and and even business owners are not thinking from the point of view of their customer they're you know i, I took over a website this was a couple of years ago and um, they had alphabet soup. It was a doctor's office and it was just all abbreviations and lingo. And I'm like, your customers have no idea what you're talking about. They, they don't know what any of this stuff means, you know, and this is not how they search for things. They don't search for the like formal name of the surgery. They search for knee replacement because that's what, they call it, you know? So I think um, one of the things you can do with content and testing is, um, I don't want to say dumb it down because that's kind of mean, but think more about layman's terms. Swap in, uh, um, swap your vocabulary and see how the page engages the customer and, and think of from their point of view. And I think that testing helps us prove those hypotheses, right? Um, that's really important to us as an agency because a lot of times our clients are like, I don't think you're right. And I'm like, well, will you let me prove it? Like, like, let me test it and we'll see who's right, you know, and then it, it's hard facts. It's not me just saying, well, my gut's telling me this is wrong. I can give you the numbers. So I think it's really important to test your content. If you're just really, if you're just writing content, 
and throwing it up and not doing the follow-up work, I don't really consider you a marketer at that point in time. That might be a little controversial, but <laughs> I, yeah. I think you're just a writer and that's okay. You can be just a writer, but, but then you need to make sure that there are other pieces of, of your puzzle or the client has other pieces of their puzzle that are looking at the conversions and the testing and the, and that other piece of it um, to, to move their marketing forward, to move their business forward. Cause that's the objective here, right? That's why we market. Say a new client's come in at Sterling Sky. What sorts of conversations would you be having to effectively figure out if content is something that's going to help them. I mean, is it is there times when content isn't needed or is it almost always a big part of a marketing strategy? I would say there are times that we have clients come on board where we don't need new content, but what they have needs to be polished and um, more than likely the internal linking for it is bad or they haven't done any of it. So we might just need to rearrange it optimize it a little better. Most of the time they're coming in with 200 blog posts that have no calls to action. And I'm like, the blog is where they put all their content, but they don't have any conversion points over there. Like, why are you, why are you putting all your effort into something with no call to action in it? Put a button on the page, you know? <laughs> so, so I think that there are times we get clients who definitely don't need like a, a new content strategy, but I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, they still need a fix your content strategy kind of thing. I don't think there's a case, I cannot think of a case where we've had a client come on and, and they not, not need content. I, I can't think of any, any scenario where you would not need content or need your content fixed up. Cool, so say a client came in and they had pretty much no content on their website. How would you be going about doing the research to figure out what content needs to be created? Mm -hmm. So I do three things. Um, the first thing I do is I ask a, a bunch of questions. Usually I try and talk to the people that answer the phone there. Um, you know, who, who's your facing customers person? And then I ask them, what do people ask you all the time? And what do they call things? And I just make notes, you know, what are the words that they, that your customers are using to describe your business? And I, and I make notes and, you know, try and come up with a good list of phrases that the customer is using. Then I'll do some key localized keyword research, you know, just around what gets volume in their primary category and sometimes secondary categories. Usually we start with the primary and work our way down the list, but, um, then, you know, do some keyword research and look at what, what they're looking for. And then I have a conversation with the business owner over where, where do you want to show up? Where are you showing up now? And where do you want to show up and give me, you know, let's look at a map together and you tell me what spots you want to focus on first. And then, so then I've got like a list of queries from the, conversation with the customer service agent and I've got a list of queries or keywords for my keyword research and then I've got a list of locations from talking to the you know owner principals in the business whoever's running the marketing on their side and then I start making a list of the most lucrative looking um, keywords or queries with location data and I start you know figuring out this list of what I need to optimize for where, and that's where I start creating my content. So um, I'm not a huge fan of like expensive keyword research tools. I don't think that they do the right thing that you want. Um, I'm a really big fan of um, keywords everywhere. Um, we use that in conjunction with location changer plugin to try and get an idea of for keyword research. And then, you know, locations is just looking at a map and having conversations with the business and being like, what about this area? What about this area? And then sometimes I really want them to focus in. I'm like, okay, like for a landscaper, for example, what neighborhoods, like if there was a neighborhood in your area where you would like to work almost exclusively, let's just pretend that would be possible. Where, where's the money 
right? That's, that's a real conversation. Like where's the money that um, is available to hire landscapers. And if you could do like everybody on one block and, in, in, you know, a few days time, once a month, where would that neighborhood be? Is that neighborhood worth optimizing for Are people in that neighborhood looking like, how do we target that? Um, and so that once we've done that, then we create like this map of queries and locations that can be put on a content calendar in a prioritized order. What's most important to what's least important. And um, then I start writing, we start writing content, we start optimizing content. If they already have it, maybe we're refocusing a little bit if they've already got some good content on the website, adding our calls to action, um, you know, and then looking at um, how is it doing? Are we engaging? Are we getting leads from this page? Okay, we're not. What can we do better? Instead of maybe just saying call today on your button, maybe you say call your geograph, you know, see Austin landscape experts today or something like that. Maybe a longer call to action, but that really drives home the location and the keyword um, does better. And then we do things like daisy wheel in, um, maybe sticking a review next to that call to action button would improve it or things like that as well. So, but really we start with conversations with the client and keyword research to really decide what direction the content needs to take. So it sounds like it's quite focused on high intent keywords. So people who are searching for something and ready to convert. So I guess if we're thinking, mm -hmm. you know, a marketing funnel, it's kind of mid to bottom. I think that's where you should start because I think that one thing that's important from an agency point of view is getting results fairly quickly. And, um, you know, you don't want them to get frustrated three months in because you're working on the long tail and it's, or, or the fat head or the long tail and it's taking longer to increase those leads where you can kind of look at the middle of the funnel and maybe you're looking at things that are ranking in the six, seven, eight, and you're like, well, if I make three tweaks to this page, I can get up to two, three, four. That's a big win as far as ranking goes. And it can be a big win as far as conversion goes because that's more volume that might be seeing coming into that page. So I think, you, I think starting a bit with the middle of the funnel mm -hmm. can be useful. It doesn't mean we're not going to look at those fat head terms or those long tail terms. I mean, that's definitely part of the strategy, but when we're looking at making the most impact right off the bat, I think looking at the middle can be the biggest win there. Cause you know, ranking for those long tail terms is generally fairly easy. I hate, the word easy because you just never know but um the volume is maybe not there you know should i spend my time in the first three months working on a keyword that's going to get one conversion a month or working on a keyword that could potentially get me 10 conversions a month and is already ranking in the you know six seven spot and if i can just bump it up a little bit maybe you know a link and a little bit of a tweak of the on-page content you know, what did I accomplish more there? Probably, you know, when you look at net lead volume there, you're probably looking at a much happier client because you got um, 10 leads from one page rather than one lead from a new page you just wrote. Yeah, you know, working your way up the funnel can definitely be a, a great way to go about it. Do you find that as time goes on, there's more focus higher up the funnel? Uh, I guess like, you know, the question I have is, you know, the idea of content marketing, right? I think the idea of like blogging regularly, uh, trying to build like inbound traffic with stuff that's not so sales focused. Is that something that local marketers should be thinking about? <laughs> so we were talking about this last week because I am not a fan of blogging just to blog. In fact, I hate it. I honestly hate it. If you're just blogging because somebody told you you need to blog twice a month, please stop doing that. You're not helping anything. And I'm also not a fan of blog posts that could be service location pages on a website. Why are you putting this in your blog? It's going to be lost in, especially if you're a high volume blogger, it's going to be on page eight. And did you do your internal linking right? And is it, is it evergreen content that now is just buried in your blog hierarchy? You know, I, I, I think if you're going to blog, it needs to be really thought about what you're going to put there 
is it something that's going to last forever? Are you going to keep it updated if it gets buried in your blog? Um, what's the longevity of its ranking? Um, you know, as we all know, blog posts sometimes just sort of fall off Google's radar after a while, right? Unless you're updating or that topic comes up again or something like that. So I think blogging has its place. I think I, I tend to loosely think of blog posts as timely content, meaning news and blog pages as timeless, meaning evergreen content that helps sell your product. And so in a blog for a local business, you talk about your community activism or your community engagement, you know, um, or mentions you got in the media or the volunteering you guys did this weekend or something like that. That would be great blog post stuff. And I think that's absolutely worth writing about and putting in there and talking about 100%. If you're writing a post about um, five ways you can tell if your personal inju injury lawyer knows what they're talking about. I'm making this up, but I don't think that's a blog post. I want that like front and center on my website so I, it can help people make the decision to hire me. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, I... I over the years, you know, I started in this industry right when WordPress was becoming popular. And then people started building websites on WordPress, which we thought, and I still think is great because it makes editing and testing more approachable for more marketers. And, you know, site owners aren't beholden to like very expensive design and development firms to tweak a word on a page, right? I think WordPress is a great invention. But I think that the myth of you need to put three posts on your blog a month for Google to like you, I, that needs to go away. Because I just don't believe that. I don't think that that's how you build your business. Unless that's your, unless blogging is your business and that's what you do. Like Bright Local, you guys are, uh, you know, you sell a tool, but blogging is what brings your inbound traffic in. Uh, you know, I think that that's, that's a different approach. But if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm a landscaper putting three blogs up a month, I'm not sure that that the return on that time investment is worth it at that point. There's like, you could take that time and do an email newsletter and probably get a lot more conversions out of it than a blog post. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. I think there is this tendency that blogging is some sort of magical way to basically grow your business but it's not always applicable. Unfortunately, it's also something that agencies can sell, right? We're going to put three blog posts up on your website a month. Woo! Yes, yeah. the old <laughs> focus on the output rather than the outcome. Right, exactly. That's a great way to put it. I like that. <laughs> okay, brilliant. So let's say you've gone through the research and you've identified the keywords and the locations to target. Using all your experience and wisdom, you've created some pages that you think, okay, these are exactly right, or at least I've got a good idea that these are the right pages and they're not ranking. Where do you go from there? Earn media, links. Um, you know, as much as we hate talking about link building, um, the reality is it's effective. So if I've written them and they're up and they're getting indexed and um, I'm getting a little bit of engagement, but they're just not knocking it out of the park like I wanted them to, you know, it's not a goal. Um, then I might go to our earned media team and be like, what can we do link wise? Maybe one, one decent link to a page like that can make all the difference in the world. If you can get it or on that topic, maybe it doesn't go directly to that page, but it's a topical link that might go to the home page, but it's talking about the content that's on that page that's linked from the home page. that could still be real valuable for linking. So um, that would probably be my next step is, is a link to help, help that content out. And possibly depending upon what they, um, what they have in their marketing mix, I might suggest a newsletter about that topic or uh, some social media posts about that topic, uh, Google My Business post, Facebook, it, LinkedIn, depending upon what their market, target market is. Um, you know, um, 
trying to just get a little bit more um, reach for that content. And then if that doesn't work, I, I'm not going to scrap it, but I might rewrite it or I might change my keyword focus a bit. I might think, oh, maybe not for this city. Let's, let's try a different city with this content and see what happens. Maybe the market just isn't right. Maybe it's too competitive or maybe it's nobody's looking for it there or something like that. And then, so the first thing I do is look for a link. So anybody who thinks that they can get away without doing any link building whatsoever, then maybe there's a little bit that needs to be done. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. I'm just, I mean, you know, if you write a piece of content that's great and it's going to convert people and it kind of works as an outreach, you know, content marketing strategy, that's great. But for a lawyer who wants a page about um, car accidents in Myrtle Beach, to rank and bring them business? Maybe, I don't know. I mean, there's ways we could write it that could be engaging to a local audience, but I'd much rather see them um, give away some pro bono consulting, like one hour consultations on that topic and get a little bit of news generated about it, or maybe a mention in an article somewhere locally or the radio and say, hey, you know, such and such law firms doing pro bono consulting. If you've been in an accident, give them a call. That can create a little buzz. You might get a link out of it. I think that's a lot more effective than just hoping people love the content and link to it. You got to do that, put the effort into it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So obviously you're very experienced and I'm sure that the work that you do has a tremendous impact, but I'm also sure that there's lots of people doing this in the wrong way. So what are some of the wrong ways that people do content? So I think that there's still this myth out there that um, it doesn't have to be unique. Um, that I can take content that was written for, let's say, Denver Dog Walker. And I can take that content and all I have to do is change it to... Um, Aurora dog walker. And so I changed the city name or I changed dog walker to dog sitting. Maybe they offer both services and leave the content mostly the same and be successful. And that is not true that if you're trying to get the same content to rank in the same market, Denver and Aurora are adjacent to each other. You're going to really struggle with that. It's probably not going to work. Now, if you're a uh, a uh, pest control company, for example, and you have locations across the country that don't compete with each other, that duplicate content where you just change the city name, it's probably not going to hurt you because you're not competing with yourself, right? But if you're in the same location and you're just, and you're just changing city names and they're all adjacent or in the same area, I think you were going to really struggle with that strategy. I don't think that's the right way to approach it. Um, I think that we have to be very cognizant of boilerplate content. A lot of websites say, okay, and, and by boilerplate, I mean disclaimers, I mean gutters, the sidebar, the footer, the things that are on every single page of the website. Maybe you've got like blocks of testimonials that are like hooked into every page of the website. That's the same content on every page of the website. It doesn't really count towards your unique content. So I think we need to look at the ratio of unique to not unique content much more closely. And that does include gutters. Uh, you know, people, people are like, oh, Google just discounts the sidebar or the footer. And I'm like, well, for ranking purposes, they do. I don't think they do for trying to determine if a page is duplicate or not. I think it all counts. I think they just look at, okay, this sentence is on this page and this page and this page and this page and this page. Ugh, you know, they don't like that. So um, you need content in the right ratio to your boilerplate, to your gutters is important in my opinion. And if you're just changing out one paragraph at the top and the, everything around it is boilerplate, the same on every page, it's probably not going to work. That's not a strategy that's going to be successful for you. Or it would, it might work in very uncompetitive queries in uncompetitive markets where you don't have a lot of com competition. It could work for you there. But um, in a competitive market, I don't think that's going to cut it. You're going to have to put more unique content on that page. 
So if you're in that situation where you've effectively got a business that offers the same service in two different markets, I guess if you're looking at it, you know, what somebody wants in Aurora versus what somebody wants in Denver is probably going to be pretty much the same, right? There's not going to be a huge difference between, you know, somebody who wants a dog walking service in one city or the next over. So how do you go about actually creating unique content that actually kind of helps the users and maybe not just to kind of not put out duplicate content for Google? So there's a few different strategies. Um, one of my favorite is um, using um, location information and um, testimonials, reviews to mm -hmm. differentiate the content. So on my Aurora page, I would put reviews from people who hire me there in Aurora. And, and if you use a really good platform, you can tag your reviews and only show those reviews on these pages, right? I think you guys do it. I know GatherUp does it. Um, so, you know, only show the Aurora reviews or reviews that mention Aurora on the Aurora page, only show Denver reviews on the Denver page. That's one way to differentiate that content. Um, talking about if you're a dog walker in Aurora and you walk dogs in Denver, where do you take the dogs on the walk? Like that's the biggest way to differentiate, you know, in Denver, you might say, we're going to go to Cheeseman Park or Capitol Hill and we're going to play Frisbee at the dog park here. And, you know, we'll do a lap around the Capitol building or go by Coors Field or whatever that happens to be. And in Aurora, it would be completely different landmarks because they're different, you know, this is where we'll go kind of thing. Um, so I think talking about the landmarks and the areas by those locations or in those locations can make a big difference. Say if you're a, um, you're a lawyer and you're, you talk about how to get to your office, maybe your office is in Denver, but this is your Aurora page. How do I get to the office in Denver? You know, the directions and what are we near and, you know, head for the mailbox building because everybody in Denver knows what the mailbox it looks like a post box. <laughs> You know, everybody knows the mailbox building, right? So um, you use the the information that somebody in Aurora would need to to understand the service or the product that you're selling them or how to get to them to buy that thing um, or, you know, hire that service. So I think those are my two favorite ways. So reviews and, and like the location content. If you're a lawyer in Aurora, maybe you talk about, you know, if you need to meet us at the courthouse, this is where you go. And this is, you know, where you should park. And when you come inside, ask the bailiff to validate your parking or whoever to validate your parking. This is where the security door is to get in. We'll meet you here kind of thing. That kind of content can really make a unique page more unique than the Denver page or the Littleton page or, you know, the other suburb pages that you're writing content about because you're just talking about that area. And people who live in that area and are looking to hire you trust you more because you, you're talking about their neighborhood in a familiar way, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you're not talking about what's around them there, or you're maybe you're like one of those nationwide lawyers that, I think that's kind of a crazy business model, but they're not, you're not even in Colorado and you're trying to say, hire me. And this lawyer's page is generic about, you know, Denver, Colorado. And this lawyer's page is, you know, we go to court in Aurora all the time and here's where we'll meet you. And here's what we know about the court system there and blah, blah, blah. That's going to really be more likely to convert that user because they feel like you're talking their language right? You're, th these are the people that are going to help me. They're familiar with my system. They're going to help me here versus a generic page about Denver that could be a page about Chicago because yeah. all they have to do is change the word, right? <laughs> yeah. It, so it's basically don't think of location as a keyword. Think of it as kind of experience that someone would have with your business if they were based in that location. Absolutely. A landscaper, you could say, um, you know, we come to Aurora on Thursdays and Fridays. That's when you can expect us. We start um, in this neighborhood and work our way south. So we, you know, here's about, you know, how, when we hit these neighborhoods, you know, things like that, that just sort of set you apart from your competitors. I'm a big proponent of looking at the content on your competitor's website and knocking it out of the park that way. Like, 
Um, most of your competitors are going to have crappy content unless they've hired somebody like us, right? <laughs> that really knows what they're doing. And so what can you do to set yourself apart for them? Convey your value proposition to them within the content, but while also optimizing it for what you do, where you do it, right? <laughs> So you shared a bit about the process that helps you identify what content you should be writing for a client. When it actually comes to writing, uh, do you have any tips or tricks to write, you know, just really great content or what would make up a kind of content on a page that you were writing? So um, I am kind of a methodical writer. I, sometimes I can just sit down and the words just come out and I can write, you know, four or five hundred words like that and be done. Most of the time, that is not how I write. I do outlines. So I know what my main topics on the page are going to be, and I'll put those down. And then I'll put like four or five bullet points underneath each one that that I'm sure is working in the location information or maybe a review or a testimonial or something like that. And then I start writing my paragraphs. Um, and and depending upon the template that I'm working, like the client's website, how we put um, testimonials in, maybe they have like a slider or a, a, a platform that they're using like Bright Local or Gather Up that inserts, injects that into the page. Or maybe we have to just copy and paste it in there. You like, maybe they don't have a handler and we have to do it by by hand. Then I start, where should I put this? Um, should it be a, a call out? Should it be just at the bottom of the page? You know, those pieces, where should I place this? Where am I going to stick my call to action buttons in? A lot of the time I mock this all up in a Google doc before I put it in the page. So I have an idea of what I want it to look like before I start fighting with WordPress to get things in the right spot. Because a lot of times, like, uh, for example, on Friday, I had written a page of content. I had it in a Google Doc. I had it kind of laid out the way I wanted it to look on the, on the page, knowing what I knew about their template. And then I spent two hours fighting with um, the WordPress block editor to make it happen. Like, that's just part of what happens, right? So, you know, I, I think the process of the the writing process is different for every writer. Some can just sit down and just have the words flow and, and, you know, make it come, come out really naturally. I'm not that kind of writer generally on, on very rare days. It really, it's really clicking for me and I'm writing well. That's generally the day where I'm like, okay, rearranging my whole day so I can just write all day because things are happening for me. But for the most part, I, I'm, making outlines. And a lot of times I have to make my outline where I'll put my main ideas in and I'm like, I don't know what to say about this. So I'll send it to the client and be like, I need four bullet points about this, this sentence. Tell me about this product or this thing you do or whatever. I need four bullet points. I don't need you to write it for me. I just need some bullet points of, because getting clients to write content is really, really hard, really hard. And I, I get it. You're a plumber. You're not a writer. I, you know, I totally understand, but I need some help. <laughs> so sometimes if I can just get three or four bullet points that can kind of kick me into the right direction. Um, and sometimes I write content and I'm guessing, I, you know, and I do a lot of research to try and figure out what's the right thing to say. Am I describing this service correctly? And I have to send it to the client for approval because I'm like, I kind of pulled this out of thin air. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> take a look. Is this right? Because I'm not a plumber and you are <laughs> kind of stuff. So, yeah. you know, I think the the process is different for every writer. For me, it's a lot of research and headings and bullet points that then turn into paragraphs. Yeah, it's really interesting what you're saying about the process. I actually took a copywriting course at the beginning of this year because one of the things that I wanted to get better at is how can I refine the process so I can more naturally write great copy. And during that course, the thing that was told to me is I actually spend way too much on the draft. I basically draft and edit at the same time. So I'm trying to basically get to the final draft on my first go, which, you know, I was told like, that's not what the draft is for. And the thing that was explained to me is spend more time, you know, researching. So there'll be three stages. 
research, draft and edit. Spend the bulk of your time doing the research because that's going to help everything else afterwards. Try and get through the draft, like write the copy. It does not have to be your best work. And in fact, getting those words out there and getting the crap out of the way is probably going to help you in the long run. And then focus on the editing. So sounds like we have some similar sort of process now where it's like very research focused at the beginning. Yeah, I think that that's for me anyway, especially when I'm writing content for industries I don't know a lot about. The research is so important because, you know, I, I'm trying to create content about something that I'm not familiar with. And when I can do headings and bullet points underneath them, and sometimes I'll end up with, I'm like, oh, well, this could be like four pages by the time I get done with my research. But that's okay. That's more opportunities, right? So then, then I might break that into, okay, I've got, you know, three topics and I've got 20 bullet points. I can actually split this into two pages of content and I should split it into two pages of content. Um, and then, but once you have all that research done and your bullet points are there, then it's way easier to turn that into a paragraph. Cause basically the bullet points are sentences, hopefully, um, or close to a sentence and you can create a paragraph. And so then you just have to put the filler in, right? When you're actually writing your first draft. And then when you refine some, that, a lot of times when I'm going back for my edits, I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> I have no clue what that means. Throw it away, you know, stuff. But I agree with that process. I think that that's how I write most of the time because I don't know anything about, you know, cannabis laws in Colorado and those types of topics. I'm like, I don't know what the rules are. I guess I got to find out. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Some on the ground research about uh, what's going down. Right. <laughs> I'll call my daughter. She's 24. She knows it all. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So what skill would you recommend a local marketer should focus on over the next one to two years to really develop their career? Ooh, I, I'm going to be selfish and say, be a better writer. Um, and, and not just like writing things that you like to read. I think you have to learn to write in the language of your customer. Um, and that's a different skill set, I think. Um, I, I think that it's almost learning how to, um, you know, I don't do a lot of in depth work into crafting personas before I create content, but I try and do some research into who is buying this service or who is shopping for this service and what, what are their pain points and how can I solve those problems? And I think if you're a good writer who thinks from that, how do I solve these problems for your customer standpoint? it's only going to serve you better moving forward. I would also say in local search, if you can learn how to spot and report spam, you're probably going to be pretty good shape as well. But I am not good at that. I am really bad at it. So that is not my, that's not under my purview. I'm, I'm like, oh, it looks legit. I'm just too nice or something, I guess. Or, or, or I don't know. I have days where I'm like, it's all spam. The whole damn Google is spam. I'm done with it. I have to go do something else because I get irritated. But um, yeah, I think becoming a better writer and really developing your writing skills because there's so much you can do with content in local search that um, being a good writer, but not just being able to put words on a page that sound nice, right? It's being a good marketing writer and, and not from a smarmy marketing. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but from the, yeah. the buzzword marketing writing, I hate that crap. I don't want to write like that. I want to solve problems for my clients, customers. And how do I write in a way that solves those problems? I was really excited when we saw FAQs become more popular because I think that that's a type of content that really resonates with shoppers, whether they're shopping for a product or a service does, you know, I have the same question and here they've already answered it for me kind of stuff. So I think, I think that being a better customer focused writer um, is the skill that I would develop in the next two, two years if, if I didn't have it. And it's something I'm always developing, right? That's, you're always, oh, that's a good way to do that. I'm going to do that next time kind of thing. Yeah, I think writing is not just a valuable skill in marketing, but in business. I think it being able yeah. to communicate effectively with words, but also, you know, layering on that customer understanding, that adaptability. 
I think it's something that translates effectively anywhere that you might be marketing. So I often see the idea of a T-shaped marketer and it's very channel focused and there's not so much focus on the skills. And I always would think like if there was one skill that you should really focus on getting better and better at all the time, it would be writing. Because mm-hmm. when you think about all of the, any of the subsets of marketing, right? Whether it's PPC, SEO, email marketing, social media, not one of those channels cannot be better served by good writing. Customer focused problem solving writing. I, I think that it's, it's an overarching skill that some, it's not some people, it's just not their forte and I totally get it. But I think that if you can communicate better, whether you're communicating internally or externally or with a customer via a website, I think that only does better things for you as, as growing your skills or your place in the industry or um, growing your expertise in front of clients. Yeah. Um, and it'll help you get leads more, right? I saw a research but done by Unbounce that showed that I think they analyzed like thousands of landing pages and looked at what influenced conversions. And they found that copy was two times more influential than design. So if you're thinking about how can you get more leads, look at the words that are down there and there should be your starting point. Yeah, I, you know, there are some websites out there that are ugly ugly and they convert like crazy because the right words are on the page and the calls to action are in the right spot right um phil rochek did a um a blog post and i can't even remember the topic of it it was something about local landing pages i don't remember the title but the examples he used a couple of them were ugly and they are conversion powerhouses and i was like wow really (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh, it's a, it is always that balance, isn't it? It's like you have to rely on the data, but then sometimes you look at things, you know, like your eyes are bleeding and you're like, oh, but it converts. <laughs> right. And, and you really, honestly, what appeals to me in design, design is so subjective. So what appeals to me might not appeal to their customer base. Right. And they yeah. just want the facts. Just give me the facts. I don't need all the shiny, flashy sliding things all over, you know, just text, tell me what I need to know. And, and I'm out kind of thing. And my mom is that kind of internet shopper. She's older, but she does not want the flashy bullshit. (laughs) She wants, (laughs) she wants like, this is what you need. This is where you get it. Here's how much it is. That's all she wants. If if every webpage was a white page that had those three things on it, she'd shop online all day long. (laughs) (laughs) Probably good. They aren't like that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So the final question. So if someone was coming into local marketing today with absolutely zero experience, what advice would you give them? Build your own website and try stuff. I think that the best way to learn is through success and failure. And so I think if you start with something you're not afraid to screw up, (laughs) um, that's, you know, a good way to start. What kind of content works and and how do I build this page and how do I optimize it to get it to rank and you know starting on your own stuff is probably the best way to get get the skills in place you need to work on other people's stuff and and I feel like it's sort of a rite of passage too if you're not willing to screw your own stuff up first I don't know if I trust you with my client stuff you know, and uh, the other skill I would, I would say is um, you need to be humble and um, lose your ego because things that you think will work, aren't going to (laughs) work. I mean, that's just, it's inevitable and things that you think shouldn't work, they might work. (laughs) So I think you need to be humble, lose your ego and start with your own website and just build one and try stuff and, you know, throw things at the wall and see what works for you, what doesn't work for you. And you may find a niche, right? You may find out I am a terrible writer. I hate writing. Every time somebody tells me to write a page of content, I get mad and I don't want to do it. Maybe that's not your thing. Maybe you ought to look at PPCs or maybe you ought to, you know, look at something some other piece right that social media or something that 
does isn't writing heavy. Um, you still should need to be able to c construct a sentence, but you know <laughs> you don't have to construct a whole page <laughs> at that point in time. Um, but yeah, I think you know trying it out, trying out your own stuff first. You know, being willing to to break things and learn how to fix them. You know, I learned how to WordPress by trial and error. I never took a class. Nobody showed me how to do things. It was all, oh, I broke that. <laughs> you know, I'm going back and fixing it yeah. and, or restoring it because I really broke it. I've done that before many, many times, you know, and I think, you know, you have to just be willing to try. Yeah, you won't often get that opportunity with clients to break WordPress. So setting up your own WordPress and doing it yourself, good way to learn. Most of us have learned local SEO by reading what those before us have written and tested and tried. You know, I would not be where I am today without Mary Bowling and Mike Blumenthal and David Mim and Joy Hawkins. Like they paved the way for, for local search and what they tested and what they still test and what they write about. And, and, you know, I think you have to be willing to learn and read um, and, and again, lose your ego. And uh, reading is only going to make you a better writer too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. Brilliant. Carrie, thank you so much. It's been a really interesting conversation about a topic that is quite dear to me, content and writing. It's something that I always look to improve upon and talking to like-minded writers and marketers is a good way to develop your skills. So thanks again for joining and I uh, hope to speak to you again very soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I had a lot of fun. I love talking about content. <laughs> I find content one of the most interesting topics within marketing because it, it requires so many different skills to come together from researching and understanding your customers to actually executing and writing compelling copy. And then there's a testing part, which I think a lot of marketers can overlook, knowing how you're gonna measure the impact of content and then testing to see how you can improve its effectiveness. I'm sure there's been loads of useful tips that you're gonna go away with and put into practice so I'd like to leave it there. Thank you for listening and I'll catch you again very soon.